Hola amigos, mi nombre es Beatriz Paul Heimus de la Fundación Banco Popular y estamos eh, hoy aquí con la gran Sonia Sermon, fundadora del Center for Social Innovation en Canadá. Eh, un lugar sumamente interesante del cual vamos a hablar eh, un poco durante eh, el día de hoy. Eh, nos sentimos sumamente honrados de tener a Tonia eh, aquí con nosotros, así que esperamos que disfruten eh, esta entrevista y que aprendan más sobre lo que es la innovación social. Así que ahora voy a cambiar al inglés para comenzar la entrevista con Tonia. Well, Tonia, hi, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. We're so excited to have you here and learn a little bit more about what social innovation is and everything that you've done uh, mm -hmm. in Canada, all that great work that, that you have done. Um, so tell us, what, what is social innovation for, mm -hmm. for you? Mm -hmm. Well, social innovation is a, you know, something that we've been doing for generations, but we now have language to kind of talk about and capture this idea that social innovation is about new ideas and renewed ideas that make the world better in some way. And there's a lot of different definitions of social innovation. Sometimes social innovation is really speaking about the, the invention piece, the social invention, this new idea that actually changes a system. But I think when we, when we really want to make sure that people can be included, we look and say, okay, not only do we need an invention, but we need the adoption of that invention. And so, for example, uh, organic food. You know, this was a, an example of a, of a social innovation. The idea that we needed to stop using pesticides on our food was, an in, was a new idea at that time. But really, the only way that that social innovation could have an impact on the world is if it was adopted in a marketplace uh, and, and in the world. And so I think it's really important to say, you know, social innovation is the biggest, broadest umbrella of what is possible to make the world better. But when we start to really dig into different strategies and different ways, we can, we can define it differently, we can understand it differently. Ultimately, it's about the change process. It's about us being intentional about facilitating uh, a new or a renewed idea that makes the world a better place. And who's considered a social, social innovator? innovator? I think that's a personal choice, right? I think a social innovator is somebody who says, you know what, I care. I care to make the world better in particular uh, uh, work or, or field. So maybe it's education, maybe it's social justice, maybe it's environmental sustainability. And it's somebody saying, you know what, I want to be a part of the solution. Uh, and so a social innovator can be anyone. It can be anybody uh, that is working within a municipality, it could be within a civil society organization, it could be within a corporation, and it's a spirit of, um, and a set of values that we bring to our work, no matter what role we might have. And I think that's a very empowering place to mm -hmm. say, I can be, uh, wherever I am, I can be a part of the solution. I can bring these ideas and these values into my work. And I, so I think that's a, it's a very broad umbrella. And mm -hmm. then I think it gets super complicated when we get into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you say that collaboration has a lot to, to do and to contribute to what social innovation is or, or yeah. to provoke uh, social innovation? <laughs> yeah, totally. So when I talk about social innovation in, a, in, a, in the context that I'm in, Uh, I would start with this idea that social innovation can be achieved in one of three big ways. So you can, you can facilitate social innovation through markets, through social enterprise and social finance and, and, and different strategies that use market forces. Then you can also use policy. Policy is a tool to facilitate a change. So uh, government folks who are in the policy making process, I think are key to being able to respond to create new policy that unlocks innovation. And then third is this behavior change piece. So how do we change, educate, uh, and engage new people in ideas so that they can become more intentional about the work that they do at a, at a cultural level. But for all of these to work, we need a culture of collaboration. We need to see that we can work across different sectors and across difference to be able to facilitate the change that we want. Because if we want to make the world better, we want to make our communities better, our country better, we have to find ways of working across sectors, which means we need a new tool set to build understanding 
so that we really can collaborate because it's going to take all of us mm -hmm. uh, from all of our mm -hmm. different perspectives uh, to be able to improve, uh, improve our country, improve our, our communities. Definitely, definitely. And, and this gives us a, a perfect segue um, to ask you to tell us a little bit about uh, the, uh, the history of the Center for Social Innovation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how, how, how did that start? Um, what, what, what gave you and the other four founders yeah. um, the, the, the urge to, to open this space and start this project? Yeah, so that's, I mean, first of all, it's, uh, it was 2004. So it's almost 13 years ago now. Uh, and, you know, it was a really simple idea. Uh, we were working in the nonprofit sector and there were very limited resources. We were, we were cash poor. And, um, and we simply asked this question, how could we share? How could we share? And how do we share at a very practical level so photocopiers and, and at the time fax machines and mm -hmm. internet mm -hmm. access and, and, and meeting rooms. How do we share these facilities to reduce our costs? But what was very interesting is very, very quickly, the sharing of the practical things was easy. It was really the sharing of our ideas, of our understanding, and sharing uh, our, our, our sort of the, the ability for us to understand each other's mission and to see how we were all connected. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, the Center for Social Innovation started with 14 organizations that came from health and education and social justice and environment who were all wanting to sort of explore how to share. Uh, and we realized that we had way more that connected us than that divided us. But we started as a social enterprise. So we're a nonprofit business, mm -hmm. which means that we needed to charge rent. And we did. And in our first quarter of operations, we generated a $572 surplus, which was amazing. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And we knew we had a scalable business, right? Yes. And so, so what happened is in 2007, we expanded, we grew our community from what had become about 21 organizations to 175 organizations. Wow. We, we started to engage the for-profit social ventures more in this process. And in 2010, we bought a building uh, to expand our business again. And in order to buy that building, we created something called a community bond. Mm -hmm. uh, this community bond offered a 4% return to investors uh, who would be willing to loan us the money secured against the value of the building. And this allowed us to expand to another 200 organizations. So we were probably at about 400 organizations by this time. And then we opened up and we tried to do something really um, different. We had been located in, in dense urban centers. Uh, and in, in 2012, we opened our third location in a low-income neighborhood in Regent Park, one of the uh, uh, sort of a Toronto community housing uh, um, project. And mm -hmm. that, that community has actually been uh, vital for our understanding of how social innovation works in real community, in, mm -hmm. in more, more difficult, more challenging topics. And so we've really, that community has become a leader in our social cohesion work. Uh, really looking deeply at diversity and inclusion as sort of core values of that community as we adapt our programs to support everyone, everyone in our communities. In 2013, crazy, we mm -hmm. got invited to open up in New York City. Uh, and so, yeah, it's an That's amazing. So exciting. It was pretty crazy. And <laughs> yes. well, at first, we said, no, 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 no. That's like too big and too much. And uh, but we had incredible partners, uh, real estate partners there. Opened up a 24,000 square foot space to another sort of uh, 180 or 200 mm. phenomenal organizations. Organization. And then finally, uh, again, our, our um, two years ago, we bought a new building. And we'll be opening up there in another year and a half. But, but I think what's important to know about CSI is although we are about creating co-working spaces and collaborative spaces for social mission organizations, that's at our core, a lot of our work is on how we're accelerating their success. How do we build the culture that supports social capital and trust building? Mm -hmm. How do we create microloan funds and acceleration supports to be able to um, support the success of these social enterprises and, and social mission organizations? And so we're now at about 1,000 organizations wow. in six locations. Uh, and we are seeing that this community is creating 
uh, an enormous number of jobs. And this is important. The social incubation that we do, we now have global comparators, and we know that social incubators create 126 jobs for every 96 jobs that a business incubator creates. Mm. And this is very interesting because as we face uh, such a transformational time in our world and in so many countries looking at jobs and employment as a challenge, the social enterprises and the social innovation really is, I think, a much better strategic choice for government to be able to start investing in that kind of job creation, creating meaningful jobs that are actually solving problems in the process of, of, of addressing employment challenges. So I think that there's an incredible opportunity uh, for us to really dig in and understand how social innovation, social enterprise, plays such a critical role in enhancing the quality of life in our communities. Great. And you started responding my last question for you, <laughs> yeah. um, which was, um, uh, we are at the Center for Social Innovation mm -hmm. of the um, OCAM mm -hmm. office here in, in Puerto Rico. Yeah. And I come from Fundación Banco Popular, who yeah. uh, two years ago started a, a, a similar uh, space, mm -hmm. uh, opened a similar space. How can government and the private sector uh, support um, this, this, this new social innovators, non-profit organizations that are trying to, to develop? Mm -hmm. how, how, how can we best um, um, uh, provide resources mm -hmm. uh, for this uh, to continue developing in, in Puerto Rico? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think your space uh, and this space here are uh, amazing foundations on which to build uh, these kinds of collaborations. And, and you know, when I first saw uh, um, uh, and heard about these 78 municipalities, it reminded me uh, of, a, of um, a project in France uh, called the 27th region, 26th region, 27th, one of the regions. Uh, and what it is is in France, they have created a shared R&D department for their 26 regions. And the 27th region is the research and innovation department for all of these other regions. And so this is very interesting as a model. And it wouldn't be the first to be able to say, how can we make sure that we're allocating a certain portion of our resources to actually innovating new ideas that can then be propagated across the different regions? And so this is, um, you know, I think it's a very, very concrete way to look at public sector innovation, right? Mm -hmm. Is how mm -hmm. are we ensuring that there's a space, a dedicated space for public sector innovation? And to me, that is what uh, my immediate thought when mm -hmm. I heard about, about this Center for Social Innovation, what it was about. But, but what you're saying is something even more interesting. It's this question of how do we recognize that each sector civil society, the social venture, the nonprofit, the government, and our corporations all need to be dedicating some space for research and innovation. Mm -hmm. And this question of, well, how does innovation emerge most quickly? Well, we know in Canada that innovation happens at the periphery and at the intersections. So innovation happens when we bring different people together from different perspectives, and it's in that tension that we find new ideas emerging that are different. And so the space that you've created with the Center for Collaboration and Social Innovation as a convening space to bring people together from these different perspectives, bringing the entrepreneurial energy together with the really concrete challenges and needs of, this, of the not-for-profit sector, and then being able to intersect and bring the foundation and corporate views into this thing. The question is, how do we, we, we've created the right container, you've created the right container, and now the question is, how do you animate to get the kinds of um, uh, emergent innovations, and very importantly for all, how do we create safe spaces where we can fail? Mm -hmm. How do we create, at those intersections, we, we create space, resources, ideas, money, we, and we create a, a bit of a, an incubator, literally a safe room around these and say, okay, we're okay if these fail, but we're gonna try. 
And until we create some spaces where we can try, we can experiment, we can push, we can, you know, beat up these new ideas and hack them down, uh, we're, we're, our, our tendency is going to be to repeat the same mistakes or the same programs. And so really, truly, I believe that it's in these intersections and these safe spaces that we can create new ideas. But don't try to do it all at once. Pilot them. Study them. Measure them. Really understand. Get a handle on what would the unexpected outcomes might be. There might be negative ones. Mm -hmm. How do we create those spaces where we can truly experiment, be okay with failure, and, and then be able to, to maintain that sense of learning and possibility and hope as we evolve these new ideas. And quite honestly, I think Puerto Rico is in an incredible position. You have real need. And really, necessity is the mother of invention. Yes. You have real need, but you also have the right kinds of partners that are coming together and incredible leadership in your communities. And so I am, I am ridiculously hopeful and excited for you. That is amazing. And you have introduced, and I do not want to end on a low note, yeah. but you have introduced the, the, the aspect of failure, mm. that it's okay to fail, mm -hmm. and that when you're trying to innovate, you have to uh, give yourself permission to fail because mm -hmm. sometimes it's from failure that the, you, you will get the best innovations in, in, in the future. Yeah. Um, and, and that is something that, that, that I think that, that we need to, to embrace uh, more. Mm -hmm. um, so, so can you uh, just um, uh, give us more a on, uh, yes, on, on that before we, we finish? Yeah, you know, I just, failure is not bad. Failure is mm -hmm. great. Because now you know that something doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's clarifying. Mm -hmm. And it releases energy. Right? And so one of the things that's so good about failure is that you have the option to let go. And when you let go, you can breathe out. You can let go. And then you can breathe in again. And you can find that energy to try something new. But holding on sometimes is just more baggage. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I just feel like it, we, we, say, we say fail fast, fail often. So, you know, for sure, one of the things that we love to do, especially with the, the tools and the technology that, that are provided to us now, the ability to fail fast and fail often is critical to be able to figure out the right ideas that really will be able to have that impact. So don't think of it as failure bad. Mm -hmm. Think about it as failure learning. Mm -hmm. And if we can change that idea, then maybe we'll be able to find those ideas that really will be able to have the greatest impact a little bit faster. Well, I think we're out of time. <laughs> um, but Tonya, thank you. Uh, we're so honored to have you here. And I'm sure it's not going to be the last time that you visit <laughs> us in Puerto Rico. Well, I just love what you're doing. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you.